This is the second lecture that deals with carbocations. Remember, carbocations here are cations, positive charge, and the positive charge is on a carbon. That makes it a carbocation. Last lecture, we looked at the stability and geometry of carbocations cations. In other words, I mean the structure, I should say, the structure and geometry of carbocations, that is there are sp2 hybridized carbons with a vacant p orbital. We looked at the stability of carbocations and we determined that for alkyl carbocations, that is carbocations that have just carbon-containing groups um, and not unsaturated. The stability is the tertiary is more stable than the secondary and more stable than the primary and much, much more stable than the methyl group, methyl carbocation. In today's lecture, we will look at the generation of carbocations. How are they made? And we will start looking at reactions of carbocations. And the first one that we look at is the rearrangement reactions of carbocations. So let's begin. In terms of the generation of carbocations, or how do we make carbocations, as you can see from this illustration here, here's a carbon that's bonded to X. X is typically an electronegative atom or groups of atoms, which makes this bond here a polar covalent bond. If this bond here is a polar covalent bond and X is electronegative, this carbon is partially positive and this X is partially negative. If there is a heterolytic cleavage, notice a heterolytic cleavage and not a homolytic cleavage as we have seen before for radicals. Here it's a heterolytic cleavage where both electrons, both electrons in the sigma bond goes to X, the leaving group. So here are those electrons. And of course, since it has acquired a pair of electrons, it's a negative charge. And what's left behind, of course, is a carbocation. So heterolytic cleavage of a polar covalent bond gives a carbocation and a leaving group. Let us see what determines a good leaving group. Why would a group leave if bonded to carbon? A good leaving group is a stable leaving group which has a charge. Well, yeah, first the charge. So you can see here iod iodide, I minus, its conjugate acid is HI. So HI is a very strong acid as you can see from the pKa here. And we learned in Gen Chem that strong acid gives weak conjugate bases. So this is a strong acid its conjugate base is I minus, which is weak and stable, primarily due to the um, size of the iodide ion to accommodate that negative charge. So this is a weak conjugate base, hence a good leaving group. So in other words, a good leaving group is a very stable conjugate base. Here is another example, Cl. You know Cl is a good leaving group. Its conjugate acid is a HCl, strong acid, as you can tell from the pKa value. So therefore Cl- is a good leaving group because its conjugate acid, HCl, is a strong acid. You can tell, however, that since HI is a stronger acid than HCl, I minus is a better leaving group than Cl minus because I minus is a weaker conjugate base. 
hence a better, better leaving group. Here's one that's neutral, water. As you can see here, the conjugate acid of water is H3O+. It has a pKa of around minus 1.7, strong acid. So therefore, H2O is a good leaving group. So there are two reasons why this is a good leaving group. One, it, the conjugate base is really stable. And number two, it is neutral. Here's another one that's neutral. Conjugate acid of ammonia is the ammonium ion. pKa here is 9.4. So even though it's a weak acid, um, well, not a very strong acid, its conjugate base here is neutral. So it's a good leaving group. You would not expect these groups here to be um, a good leaving group because they are such strong conjugate bases and hence not good at stabilizing that negative charge, very reactive. Of course, as you know, the amide here is a very strong base that's used in organic chemistry. Likewise, the OH- minus is a very strong base that's used in the gen chem lab, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. So the take home lesson from this slide is that good leaving groups here are very stable conjugate bases, which means that the conjugate acids of these leaving groups are very strong acids. So let's look, let, let's apply that concept here. Here we have a carbon that's bonded to iodide. Will this bond break? Yes, it will, because I minus is a very good leaving group because it's a very stable conjugate base. And we have in the process of this heterolytic cleavage of this bond to give us a carbocation. Here's another one, bromide, it's a good leaving group. Bromide anion is very stable. Its conjugate base is very, st well, it is a conjugate base, it's very stable. Its conjugate acid, however, is HBr, a very strong acid. So therefore, this is a good leaving group. And the heterolytic cleavage of this bond here will give Br- and our carbocation. So that's one way of generating carbocations. Let's look at this one. Here we have a carbon that's bonded to an electronegative oxygen that's part of this group right here. Now if this bond breaks, we get here the acetate anion. And as you can see, its resonance stabilized, so this negative charge here can be delocalized to this oxygen through resonance. So this is a good leaving group. Why is it a good leaving group? It's a good leaving group because it is resonance stabilized. And of course, in the process of a heterolytic cleavage of the bond, we have generated here a carbocation. Here's another one. It's a good leaving group that's used a lot in organic chemistry, and that's the tussle group. As you can see here, if this bond breaks, putting these electrons onto the oxygen, we have this. And of course, as you can imagine, we can have here delocalization, putting that negative charge onto one of these oxygens, making the tussle group here a very stable leaving group and what's left behind is a carbocation after a heterolytic cleavage of this CO bond right here. So those are ways of generating carbocations. Let's look at a couple more. Alcohols, they contain a very poor leaving group as we have discussed before. So OH- minus here is a poor leaving group. Why? Because OH- minus is a very strong base. As you saw from the previous slide, the conjugate acid of OH- minus is H2O. And that has a pKa of around 15. So therefore, a very weak acid. So therefore, its conjugate base OH- minus 
is a very poor leaving group strong base so this bond will not just break as we know alcohols are fairly stable but in the presence of an acid however here's the acid H plus we will have a protonation here and here it is so now we have here water as a leaving group so if this bond breaks in a heterolytic fashion we get water which as we said before is an extremely good leaving group because it is neutral and in the process generates your carbocation as you can imagine same here this group here the mean in this case dimethyl amide would be a very poor leaving group because the conjugate acid of the amide um, anion is um, um, ammonium ammonia so you'd expect that to be a, a very weak acid which means that its conjugate base here which would be N CH3 CH3 and of course it has two electrons and minus that's the amide that's a very strong base as a matter of fact a very strong base that's used in organic chemistry so it's not a good leaving group so this bond would not break automatically or spontaneously but if in the presence of an acid creating an ammonium ion in this case here this bond here can break to put these electrons here to generate a neutral amine which is now a good leaving group and of course what's left behind is a carbocation so we have at least demonstrated here that there are well different ways to make carbocations but primarily the heterolytic cleavage of a CX bond where X is a good leaving group if it's not a good leaving group such as the OH it can be converted into a good leaving group and leave and carbocation is generated okay let's look at another way of uh, the application of this as you know carbocations are generated in the rate determining step of E1 reaction mechanisms notice E1 here means unimolecular elimination so here's the general mechanism of an E1 mechanism elimination unimolecular here we have an um, a compound here which has X a good leaving group in the rate determining step it leaves to create a carbocation remember the rate determining step here is the slow step of a reaction so this is the slowest step of that reaction mechanism in a second step the base abstracts a proton and these electrons come in to form the alkene right here so this is an application of the generation of carbocations in a unimolecular elimination reaction and that's done of course or accomplished in the rate determining step another application is in the SN2 SN1 reaction unimolecular substitution S substitution unimolecular um, nucleophilic substitution so in the RDS here we have a good leaving group again it leaves and we have a carbocation in the rate determining step which is RDS and of course in a fast step we have the nucleophile bonding here to get the substitution product here so that's a unimolecular substitution reaction or the SN1 I think he well here's the reaction profile for these SN1 and E1 reaction where the first step is the rate determining step why because the rate determining step is a slow step so the energy of activation for the slow step is pretty high as you've seen here to create the carbocation intermediate and then in a fast step we have the products here given so this is the reaction profile our energy diagram for the SN1 unimolecular 
or E1 unimolecular elimination reactions. Let us look at another way of generating carbocation. And here is an alkene. Of course, an alkene here is a Lewis base because it has an, a pair of pi electrons right here, two electrons. It's also called a Lewis base because you, you may recall from Gen Chem that a Lewis base is an electron pair donor. So in the presence of E+, plus, we've called this an electrophile or Lewis acid. In the presence of E+, plus, opposite charges, they will attract. So these electrons will come out here. Let me get rid of this here. Sorry about that. So in the presence of an electrophile here, we will have a reaction where these electrons bond here to get here. So we have a carbocation right here. Or, of course, as you can imagine, it could bond over here, and we have a carbocation here. If it's symmetrical, so in other words, if all these groups here are the same, you generate one type carbocation. If it's not, you have two possible carbocations based on the groups that are bonded to the carbon. Let, it, let us see the implication of that. So in this reaction, methyl cyclohexene, these electrons can react with hydrochloric acid. Of course, as you know, hydrochloric acid is HCl, where this H is um, the proton donor. And here, the proton bonds to this to give the carbocation here or here. So we have two types of, two different types of carbocation. Of course, as you know, this is a tertiary carbocation. Why tertiary? Because this carbon here, which has the carbocation, is bonded to one, two, and three carbons. Tertiary. This is a secondary carbocation because we have an H right here. And the same H is right here. And if this H goes there, it's um, an, um, another H here. OK, so if this H goes here, we have a tertiary. And if this H goes over here, we have this. And so this has that H still there. So this is a secondary carbocation. Let me do that again, just, just to emphasize. So this is an alkene, four bonds. So an H is the fourth bond. So if this H bonds over here, we get this carbocation. If this H bonds here, as shown here, we get this carbocation. So this is the tertiary carbocation and the secondary. Another example is shown here. So this H can bond to here, or it can bond to here to generate this carbocation, a tertiary, or this carbocation, a secondary. So we can generate carbocations or make carbocations by an alkene reacting with a electrophile such as a proton. OK, now let's concentrate now on the rearrangement of carbocations. So as we said before, the alkene here, double bond, can bond to an electrophile proton here. And as you can see, if that ac that's accomplished, we have a carbocation right here. So in other words, these electrons here, well, there's an H here, and there's an H here. So if this H bonds to this carbon, we now have two hydrogens here, and the positive charge goes here. So this is a secondary carbocation. So in terms of the rearrangement of carbocations, it's possible to go from a secondary to a tertiary carbo carbocation, which is more stable. How does that accomplish? Is that this hydrogen with its electrons here, notice a hydrogen with its electrons is called a hydride. So it undergoes a one, two shift or migration over to this carbon. So it moves from this carbon to this carbon, and here it is with its electrons. It will neutralize this positive charge, but it has taken these electrons with it, so it, what's left behind is a positive charge. 
and that is of course as you can see a tertiary carbocation so that's a rearrangement uh, it's important for reactions as you can see here if you have this alkene and you're trying to add HCl across you did get this as the expected product of course the HCl can add here or reverse here and here to get expected products because it can add to this carbon and that carbon either the H and the HCl or the H and the Cl reverse but this is unexpected it's the unexpected product here so what as you can imagine we won't work through the mechanism but as you can imagine protonation here would give the carbocation right here and then there is a migration there is a migration of this H well let me draw it again draw it so we'll have here this CH3 and an H and a carbocation and a migration of this H gives a tertiary carbocation and of course the Cl- minus comes in and reacts here to give this as the unexpected product so that's way, one way of explaining unexpected products that are formed for these type reactions because in the rate determining step of these reactions a carbocation is formed once a carbocation is formed it is possible to have rearrangement and typically rearrangement goes from the less stable to the more stable carbocation here's another example here okay well here's the mechanism so we have the H coming in bonding to that I mean the alkene bond into this H here this bond breaks so we have a carbocation here then we have the 1,2 hydride shift to get the carbocation right here notice a 1,2 hydride shift so we go from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation and of course the last step as you can imagine the Cl comes in to bond here to give the unexpected substitution product so this type substitution product would be described as a SN1 because the rate determining step in an SN1 reaction is the formation of the carbocation which then rearrange. Here's another, another example. Of course, we have, we have discussed the 1,2 hydride shift but it's possible to have a 1,3 hydride shift, 1,4 hydride shift or even higher but less observed. So here's an example of a 1,4 hydride ship. 1, 2, 3, 4. So this hydrogen here with its electrons here migrates over to this carbocation. This is the transition state for the migration. So we have this. So a tertiary moving to a tertiary here. So as I mentioned, it's, it's rare, but it's invoked to explain different observations. Let's look here at another migration and this is the methyl migration the migration of an alkyl group in this case the methyl group with its electrons so let's look at this here is the HCl again double bond right here expected products but here's the unexpected product notice it would appear that one of these methyl groups is now migrated to this carbon of course we know what happens here is that the carbocation is generated here this group migrates to give the more stable tertiary carbocation and then the Cl- attacks. So that mechanism we won't work out but it's similar to the others except in this case it is the CH3- minus. notice migration with its electrons and it's called a methyl migration. Let's look at another type reaction here. And this is a bond migration. Now instead of having a methyl group or a hydride migrate, we have an, an entire bond that's migrating here. So let's look at this reaction. It's, of course, as you can imagine, it's a substitution reaction where this is the leaving group here to generate the carbocation in the rate determining step. And this is our nucleophile with its unsaid pair of electrons bonded here. So this is the expected product where the nucleophile, um, where this leaving group leaves, put a carbocation here, and the nucleophile comes in to give 
the substitution product right here and of course HCl but this product here is the unexpected product it looks as if there's a ring expansion so this is a five membered ring right here but over here it's a six membered ring so there is a ring expansion which means a bond migration to form a larger ring now let's see how that's done so here's a proposed mechanism to explain both products so of course in the RDS we expect this to happen so this is really the RDS rate determining step for this subst SN1 reaction here's a carbocation if the methanol attacks here we get this and this is the expected product however if this bond here migrates over to here as shown with this arrow we have this and I find it very easy to number these carbons and so I know exactly where um, the carbocation will end up so if you follow these numbering you will see that bond 3 is now bonded to bond 1 so here it is and bond 2 is left with a methyl group and a carbocation so, but you can draw it a little differently six membered ring and here is the um, carbocation on carbon number two and here comes the nucleophile and the rest is very similar so here's the unexpected product right here because the carbocation that's formed here the secondary carbocation secondary carbocation due to a bond migration converts to a tertiary carbocation which goes on to a product and of course this happens because um, a bond migration occurs to give a ring expansion in terms of migration the ideal bond angle for or dihedral angle for bond migration is close to zero as you can imagine here's the migrating group R here's a carbocation in front so this is behind and this is in front it's much easier for these electrons here to just migrate over into the p orbital right from behind so they're directly behind the p orbital so that migration will occur much easier so a dihedral of zero or close to zero how do we know that because if we have this system here there is no migration of this alkyl group over to here why because number one the bond the dihedral angle is not favored for that and number two the geometry at the bridge head here does not favor the sp2 which is required for or yeah, required for a sp2 um, carbocation let us look at another type reaction and it's called the pinnacle rearrangement here we have a 1,2 diol, so 1,2 diol in the presence of an acid. Here is the product. Same, another example here, 1,2 diol in the presence of an acid. Here is the product. The question is, what is the mechanism to go from this reactant here in the presence of an acid to give this product let's see if we can figure that out so here's a mechanism for the um, one two diol to, uh, well, which has the two phenyl groups on each carbon in an acid as you can expect here we have electrons so and a nucleus well which act as a Lewis base acid so we'd expect protonation to occur right here and here it is we've just demonstrated that this is a poor leaving group but if protonated it becomes a good leaving group so it leaves as water and what's left behind is a carbocation okay so we have the possibility of a migration to occur here we can do the methyl migration or the phenyl migration it turns out that the phenyl group migrates over the methyl group over to this carbon. We'll see why in a second. So the 
phenyl with its bonding electrons migrates to this carbon leaving behind a carbocation. You may say why does that happen? This happens because of this the stability of this carbocation that's gained from the electrons on the adjacent oxygen. So as you can see these electrons come in to form the carbon oxygen double bond and gives up a proton as the catalyst. So this is the product. The migration of the phenyl group with its electrons, with its electrons over to this carbon here and leaving behind a carbocation that's stabilized from the adjacent electrons on oxygen and eventually gives the product here. That's called the pinnacle rearrangement. Why does the phenyl group migrate and not the methyl group? In terms of migration, as you can see, it's a carbocation, so in terms of the migrating group, the group that migrates must best accommodate the positive charge. The phenyl ring, based on its electrons, can accommodate the positive charge as shown here, so that has the greater potential to migrate compared to the methyl, which cannot accommodate a positive charge as good as the phenyl ring. So the order of migration, you'd expect the phenyl group here to be a better migrating group than the methyl. In fact, here shows the um, order of uh, migratory tendency towards a carbocation. This one, this is the phenyl group, but notice this has electrons back here so it can donate electrons into the ring to even stabilize it more than just the um, phenyl ring. Same here. This, and then this is last. Of course, afterwards we have the alkyl group down here, and way down here we have the methyl group. So that's the tendency of m groups to migrate from um, adjacent atoms to a carbocation. Here is a practical example of an SN1 that we'll look at in more detail in the next lecture. But here is a good leaving group. You may recall the OTS. It leaves. And of course, if that leaves, the nucleophile here, which is the acetate, can come in to give this product here. Or this group can migrate to give this product over here. And I think um, yeah, that's the last slide. So for this one, we'll see that there are two possibilities here. One is, one is the one is the. Let me get the reading again here. So pen um, red. So this is this forms a carbocation here. This reacts to give this bond. Migration of this group over here puts a carbocation right here. Notice this group migrates and not the methyl, so it puts a positive charge here and the acetate comes in and attack that to give this as a product. So we have two possible products. Why? It's an SN1 reaction. RDS generates the carbocation right here and because of that we can have rearrangement in this case, a phenyl migration to give two different carbocations and attack by the nucleophile gives two different products. So that's the end of this lecture. Um, next lecture, we'll have more reactions of, 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 of carbocations. That's going to be a short lecture because we covered quite a bit in this lecture here. So go ahead and continue reading and, um, and um, I'll post the other lecture shortly before the week is out, okay?